Good morning. It is a good morning, and it's good for us to be gathered here together in this time, in this place, in the presence of God, where each and every one of us is welcome. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to take a moment here to fill out those friendship pads along the end of the pew, and you can pass them down around the bend, across the gaps, and everybody has a chance to sign, and then as it makes its way back, you can see who you're sharing the pew with if you don't already know. Um, would draw your attention and your bulletin um, to, to your inserts. You've got, um, you've got one insert, the yellow one, that talks about the Advent offering. You can look through those, those choices, give some prayerful consideration, and use your, your offering envelope to, to respond as you're led. On the back side of that, you have some information about the alternative gift market. And I've been told you need to, to hurry, don't run, but walk briskly um, after the service into the Friendship Center because this is the last Sunday uh, for you to take advantage of the alternative gift market. So you can look through that and then you can be prepared to respond accordingly to that as well. I uh, do want to thank folk for being conscious about those name tags. They are a big help. If yours has been lost in this place, um, you can let us know. You can sign the, the, the clipboard out here in the Welcome Center and we'll get one ordered for you and it'll come and be hanging on the board out there for you uh, with that. Uh, guests, we'd like to invite you to be sure to um, take one of the gifts ba gift bags from the, either the back or out the Welcome Center, our way of saying thanks. Uh, for enriching our worship with your presence here this morning. Again, just a reminder, if you're a hearing aid uh, and you got it uh, s uh, equipped with the T-coil, you can flip that over and take advantage of the T-coil center uh, system here. Um, as far as our rosebud on the altar this morning, that's in celebrating Jackson David Arsenault, who we celebrated last week with the news and the announcement. Uh, so that's there to celebrate um, uh, his birth. And the other flowers on the altar are shared with us this morning by Joy and Dennis Anderson, so thank you. Uh, for your generosity, and you can be sure to express your gratitude to, to them as well. Um, ministry Spotlight, just a reminder that our next Sunday at 1030 is our Christian uh, Christmas Children's Worship Service. If I talk slow, I can get it all out uh, with that. Uh, so a reminder, at 1030 next week will be that service. Uh, there will be also an 8 o'clock service uh, with that week as well. Do we have, I know we've got some others, uh, announcements? Hi, everybody. Uh, as you remember, we're having a party on uh, December 25th. It's called the Christmas Dinner. And uh, thank you very much to everybody who signed up for pies and uh, uh, lettuce and all the other stuff. We're actually, our lists are full, but but <laughs> um, and thank you also for all those who signed up to help out in various ways we're doing good on a lot of the pre-christmas day stuff we need a few more souls to be helping us out on december 25th itself maybe a few earlier in the morning but mainly just before noon at noon and afterwards for cleanup i've got some uh, sign up here and I'm going to pass these around and if you're so moved you can sign up here if, um, if you're not 100% sure you need to consult that's fine you can contact the church office as well but we really appreciate it thank you hello hello I would like you to take notice in your bulletin of a volunteer opportunity at the elementary schools uh, we are looking forward to people to read with students on December 17th from 7.30 to 8 a.m. If you are interested, you can sign up on the clipboard over there or email my mom. Her email is in the bulletin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to everyone at this church who has helped with this event in the past. Thank you. And this church has been involved with this event. We did the program with the literacy and opportunities to read to students. So I know we've had a lot of people come in the past. So if you are interested this year again, just let me know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you much. We'd also draw your attention to one correction uh, in the calendar for this week on your bulletin there. You notice on Wednesday, uh, there's a UMW Christmas tea. The time that's listed in the bulletin is incorrect. So you're welcome to come at 1215, and we'll be nice to you if you do come early that day, but everybody else is going to show up at 130 for that tea. Uh, so you, if you're involved with that, you might want to make that change in, in your notes there. 
Do we have any other announcements, additions, or corrections that we need to be aware of? Then I invite you to stand as you're able that you can greet each other with your signs of Christian love and community. Good morning. Um, I'm going to apologize for my voice right now. Um, combination, bad week to get a head cold and maybe do some extra vocal work during the week. Um, at the first service, I said that if, it, if what I'm going to say in the next couple minutes doesn't make much sense, you can blame it on the cold medicine. But then I got to thinking afterward, there's probably a lot of people walking out of that first service thinking you must take cold medicine most of the time. So, <laughs> so I'm going to forego that part. But um, this morning's lectionary reading, sorry, I sound like an adolescent. Uh, this morning's lectionary reading references kings or leaders and two qualities that people pray to God that these leaders will be given in order to rule appropriately. Um, my personal opinion on leadership is that everyone's a leader in some, some way or fashion. Uh, some because of, of positions or, or what they have to do are just more easier to see than others, but uh, lots of people lead behind the scenes. And although there are numerous ways to lead, um, depending on the individual and their situation and personality and so forth, I don't believe any of us can go wrong by having a fundamental basis of being a servant leader. And uh, there's, there's a couple, three things that go with servant leading, and uh, a servant leader looks to the, the glory of his or her master. And I think we can probably all think of times that we've been involved in either certain tasks or things we needed to get done, where we sometimes get swept into thinking that the master is actually the task and how well I can do that, instead of, uh, you know, instead of trying to just be pleased to glorify uh, God uh, where is where we start with those things. The second point maybe is a servant leader sacrificially seeks <coughs> the highest joy of those that we serve. And this requires us to make necessary sacrifices uh, to pursue people's uh, progress and joy in their faith. And then looking for ways to intentionally serve, uh, even something as simply, simple as the small acts of kindness to those that we come in contact with daily. Um, I've, I felt very blessed this week to witness probably a fantastic example of servant leadership. Um, and I don't want to embarrass anybody right now but uh, that's not my motive. But if you played any kind of part in, uh, in Brian Mitchell's production, uh, the play that, that he put on, uh, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, would you please stand right now? And I'm, I mean serving, I mean, you no, know, if you served, if you did anything in there, I still can't hardly look at Jill without laughing somehow. <laughs> But um, please join me in appreciation for everything that they did. Because I, I can only imagine how many countless hours by everybody it took to organize and get all that done. And, and my one regret out of the whole thing is that I hope that I didn't laugh loud enough to distract other people that were in the audience that night. Because I did feel myself doing that. Um, but what a, what a great way to, to be a servant leader. Um, you know, the greatest servant leader was, was Christ. 
and uh, the power of servant leadership, I think, can be boiled down to a very few words, and they're incorporated in a, in a song by the Christian rock band down here. And these song lyrics I'm going to read here, I'm not as brave as Dave Van Arkel is when he sings in these areas, but I, I just want to read this. And the, entitle, the title of the song is How Many, Sin How Many Kings. And it says, how many kings stepped down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? He only wanted that for me, all for me and all for you. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for this day and the opportunity to be in this place to worship you together. Help us all to be the best servant leaders we can be in whatever our circumstances are. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. By the star, God is calling us to follow a path toward justice. Mary's response was, for though I'm God's humble servant, God has noticed me. We remember Mary, a young lady barely older than a youth, innocent and powerful, scared, worried, and waiting as her life unfolds in very unexpected ways. She sings boldly when she is expected to be meek. She is the beginning of a mighty work of God as the proud are brought down and the lowly are lifted up. On the second Sunday of Advent, we light this candle as a symbol of God's promise through Mary of a justice that does not, that does not distinguish between the mighty and the marginalized. We'll now join in the opening hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed.
please join me in the opening prayer? Visionary God, in this season of preparation and reflection, let us see, as through your eyes, the way the world can be. Hope, peace, joy, and love are more than just nice things that could be. Help us work to make them really be, as clothing and water, as food and fire. Make us bearers of your promise to the world, that all may know the power of your holy love. Amen. Psalm 72 is a royal psalm that possibly was used at the time of the enthronement of the king or at the anniversary of the ceremony. It is a prayer asking God to grant justice and wisdom to Israel's king. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that, er the water, that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. This is the word of God. All right, who can tell me about Mary? Um, that she has a song Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> but in the Advent season, that's true, good point, good point. Um, in the Advent season, who is Mary? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know who Mary is? Uh-huh. Who? It's Jesus' mom. Jesus' mom, I that's that. right. You knew that? All right, well, um, today we're going to talk about Mary. What did God ask Mary to do? What did God, who did God send to Mary to tell her what he would like for her to do? An angel named Gabriel. Good job. You guys are paying attention in Sunday school. That's good. Um, so if God sent an angel to you to do a big job, how would you feel? Scared? Would it kind of freak you out a little bit? Hide under your bed? <laughs> yeah, what about you guys? I would be happy. Be happy? Yeah? yeah. Be happy too? All right. Well, in the city of Nazareth, there lived a young woman who was faithful to God, and her name was? Bob. Bob? All right, we'll go with Bob. Joseph. Joseph? Um, and one day, God sent an angel to Mary to tell her that she was going to have a special baby and he would be the son of God. God had chosen Mary to be the mother of Jesus and even though it was incredible, Mary believed what the angel had said. So she sang praises to God for making her the mother of Jesus and keeping his promises to his people. All right, so we're gonna say a little prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus at just the right time. We praise you because you, you use humble, ordinary people in your plan. Help us to believe your word like Mary did. Amen. Good job. Do the crime, do the time. That's our understanding of justice. We have a whole set of understandings, rules, and laws built around that concept of justice. You break the rule, you break the law, you violate those commonly held understandings of society, and there will be consequences. 
We have people who are charged with maintaining and carrying out those rules, those laws, those understandings. The psalm this morning names for us one of those folk who had that responsibility, the king. Yet as the king ascended to the throne, this psalm was read as a part of that celebration, but it was not granting to the king or celebrating the king's right to use his position for his own benefit. It was not even recognizing his ability to protect his or anyone else's privileged lifestyle. Rather, it implies that those with privilege and means already have access to all of that. The economic, the social, the legal systems would take care of them. But as king, as king, he was to protect, he was to advocate for, he was to provide for those who would not be able to access all of those systems on equal grounds. Being the king was not a life of luxury and ease. It was a responsibility of caring for all, including the forgotten, the powerless, the undesirable, the rejected, the marginalized. The most powerful of all was the one charged with caring for the powerless. That's a whole different understanding of justice than what we commonly accept and live by. It's not concerned at all with who broke what rule and what would it take for that person not to inconvenience or upset or terrify or threaten society. Those those things would be the outcome of the justice the king was responsible for. The concern, the justice that the king was charged with meting out was a justice that asked the really hard questions. What harm has truly been done? What's needed to repair that harm? Who is responsible for repairing? All of that is much harder to determine than simply deciding what law was broken, who did it, and what the punishment should be. God's justice was not concerned with revenge or retribution. Its focus was restoration. For if retribution was what God sought, it would have all ended there at the gates to the Garden of Eden. If retribution had been what God was seeking, there never would have been the story of Noah's Ark because nobody would have been left after the flood to tell it. If God's justice sought retribution, then the legion of angels definitely would have descended there in that garden of Gethsemane to prevent Jesus from being arrested and then killed. But retribution, that punishment for broken rules, was not what God sought or even seeks today. Christ went to the cross because God wants restitution excuse me, restoration. For those who live in a world that punishes all who do not conform and comply, that's a baffling concept. Maybe baffling's too mild. It's a concept that turns our world upside down and inside out, just as Mary's song did. You see, the, the king was called upon not to follow the practices of all the powers that be. Rather, his justice was to imitate God's justice. And as the king set the example, all of those for whom the king ruled were also to imitate him. They were to imitate God's justice. A couple weeks ago, Zach led us through a celebration of Christ the King Sunday. It was a day that we celebrated Christ as our king, the one whose life we would fashion our own after. That means our sense of justice would have to change from what the world around us would dictate. That's not a sentence that brings ease and comfort to us. It implies a major, major change in our world. But that change is not an endorsement of just anything then goes. It doesn't mean that we open the doors to whatever trips your trigger. It's not an enticement for us to step away from accountability of any kind. It means, though, that we are going to stop worrying about punishing just for the sake of retribu retribution and revenge. It means we're going to find ways to restore lives and to mend breaches of trust. 
It means we're going to ask the hard questions of what harm was done, what's needed to repair the harm, and who's responsible for repairing it. Justice is way more than simply balancing the scales between a wrong that's done and its consequences. It means we're going to tip those scales all the way to grace, restoring grace, life-giving grace. When we fashion our lives around the wrongs that we have experienced, the pains that those wrongs bring, the fear that it will happen again, we're never free of them. In fact, they actually become what shapes our lives as we try to move forward in our living. And we end up becoming the living image, the living reminder of all that is wrong by the way we choose to live. Justice demands more than the memorializing of all that is and has been wrong. Justice demands that ways be open to new ways of living, that ways that replace despair with hope, ways that replace pain with healing, ways that replace hatred and fear with love and consolation. On this second Sunday of Advent, we are reminded that if we are to be ready to receive our King, if we are even going to be able to recognize our King, we have to train our senses to pick him out from all the distraction, all the glitter, the tinsel, the promotions for the latest and the best, all the things that tell us it's okay to get even in order to settle the scores. For the wisdom of ages tells us that unless we practice seeing in ourselves and in each other that which we seek to find in him, we will miss him. So, people, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to ask the hard questions. One harm truly has been done. It's not enough just to know what rules have been violated. We need to understand the harm that has happened in the lives of the people involved. We will need to, to listen to understand the pain, the injury, the fear, and the loss that has been injected into the life of one by the choices and actions of another. There may or may not have been intent to cause harm. Determining what is the rule that has been broken is a, is a question that's not ours to ask. That's a rule-breaking question. That's a, a revenge and retribution type of question. Harm can be done, you see, without breaking any of the laws. It's not illegal to drive your car two blocks when you have healthy legs and sound heart and working lungs. And yet the carbon footprint of our lives of convenience leaves something that is not harmless. What harm has been done? What's needed to repair that harm? Once we know the harm, we can begin to learn what's needed to heal it. We're not interested in fixing the blame. As understandable as it is, we're not even interested in, in another's hurting as much as what they have hurt us. What it takes for that harm to be repaired is our question. It doesn't matter if we try to find out, if you've hurt me, how can I hurt you so you understand the hard question is, the harm's been done. The break of relationship has unfolded. What's needed to build the bridge? What's needed to repair the harm? That question goes way beyond just the moment of that one particular interaction. It goes all the way back to the factors in that other person's life that made that harmful choice appear to be the best one in the first place. What is the pain? What is the fear, what is the brokenness that drove them to that choice in the first place? We can't address what is broken between us without understanding the why that it occurred. There is no way not to repeat what has happened without fixing the why. Who's responsible for that? Who's responsible for repairing the hurt the harm, the brokenness that has occurred. 
Again, at this point, we're tempted to go to fix the blame because surely if they caused it, it's up to them to make it good. But that's retribution again. We want to know instead who's capable of repairing the damage done. It may be the one who caused the harm, but usually it takes more than that. Forgiveness requires the work of all who are involved. Repairing the harm that is done may require even those who are not directly involved in it, those who have nonetheless the knowledge and the resources to facilitate the restoration. As those who follow Christ, we are committed to letting his life show through our living. We're committed to living those hard questions. What's the harm? What's needed to repair it? And who's going to do it? We are committed to living in such a way that opens this way to healing. For we live in a wounded world that is crying out for the healing. I invite you to stand as you're able that we can join together in hymn number 2177 in the black faith we sing. As we come together this morning, we come as, as people who have great joys to share, though those things where we have felt God touch our lives in such a way that we find that, that, that peace, that wholeness, that affirmation of being. We also come as people who have great cares, burdens that are large enough that we come hoping, hoping that here we can find those, those hands, those words that will help us carry that burden and assure us that God truly is present even then. Are there requests for prayers this morning, either of joy or of care? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's 
Okay. So we'll join with Lily in a, in a prayer of joy and thanksgiving for the family that is present. Welcome. Good to have you here this morning. Yes. Are there others? Yes, yes. So we'll give our thanksgiving for all of those who are a part of that experience uh, on stage, behind the scenes, um, that allowed that, that event and that time of coming together to happen. So thank you, Dan. Are there others? Yes. Gracious Lord, we give our thanks to you this day for all the ways in which you have let us know of your presence in this world and in our lives. We join in giving uh, our thanks for the gift of, of family and for the love and support we, we find there, and we join with Lillian celebrating her family being present this morning. We also celebrate with the Rodebushes who shared uh, last hour that their one granddaughter um, was one in 10 that one stayed in, in, in Pom Pom and, and also celebrating the other granddaughter who wrote the choreography for that performance. Uh, and the great joy it brings when one is able to share those gifts. And in that line, we also give our thanks for all of those who are part of, of the dinner theater and the way in which they reach into the community and, and beyond with their offering of self and their gifts uh, to, to that particular event. We give our thanks uh, along with the Packers for time with family away and, and also the, our thanksgiving for safe travels and arriving back home amongst friend and family here. We give our, our prayers this morning also for all of those who have accepted that invitation to, to live their lives in such a way that they are that living witness of your presence. And we thank all of those who are in the Stephen ministry for the work of the Trinity United Methodist Church in Des Moines, for women at the well in, in Mitchellville, and for Linda Stransky with Project Jubilee and Larry Keese with his missionary work at the African University in Zimbabwe. We also pray your blessings for, for our Bishop Lori Holler and our District Superintendent, uh, Reverend Hechan John, as they offer themselves to the work and ministry of the church. We are mindful, Lord, that there are those who are, who are in need of your healing touch. For those that we list before you this morning, we pray that each and every one that is named there will feel your, your healing touch in their lives in such a way that they find the wholeness that they are in need of. We also would, would give our thanks to you for the word that we've had of, of Jerry um, Holsing's uh, successful surgery uh, this past week and, and the, his good recovery thus far and the news that it may well be early this next week that he'll be released and able to return home. We also join in giving our thanks to you for um, Carol Jordan's news that, that uh, her infection in her cornea has resolved itself and, and she is healing well from that and we give you thanks for that healing touch there. Lord, for all of these folks, we pray for them and we also pray for those who offer um, their care for those physical needs that be guided by, by your wisdom in that. We would also, Lord, lift up those who are dealing with mental health. We pray that they too might find that healing uh, touch in their lives and, and find the wholeness that they are, they are in need of. And we also pray for all of their providers as well, that they also be guided by your wisdom as they offer that care. Lord, we are aware that there are those who are dealing with concerns in life, um, we pray for the, all of those who are dealing with the aftermath of the fires in California. We lift up St. John's Lutheran Church here in Grinnell as they are going through their process of a pastoral change. And Lord, for those who are dealing with long-term needs in life, we pray that they not only have the strength for those needs as we list them before you this morning, but also that they each one might have the courage to turn to you and rest upon you through those times. And Lord, for those who are going through a time of loss, we pray that their hearts might be comforted and they find peace there for this time of, of, of grief. We lift before you this morning uh, Larry Nicewander's family with the loss of his brother-in-law. We also lift up the C family for the loss of, of Megan's friend, Sheila. Lord, wherever there is conflict in this world, whether it be between friends, within a family, within a community, between nations, we pray that in those places, your love, your peace would manifest itself. Lord, we pray for 
for those who have been displaced and now travel as refugees or as immigrants, that they might find the safe sanctuary that they, that they need. And Lord, for all of those whose lives have been touched by violence or terrorism, that as they pick up the pieces of their life and begin to rebuild, we pray that they are able to do so upon a strong foundation of your love, your grace, your mercy. We pray for all of these things, as well as those things we hold upon our hearts, as we praise your Son, our Lord and Savior, God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as the ushers wait upon us, we are reminded that this is a chance for us to offer not only just our gifts, but to also offer ourselves, our very lives, to the work of God's kingdom. Let us pray together. May these gifts further God's vision of a world of justice, righteousness, equity, and prosperity the world over. Amen.
And now as we prepare to go from this time and place to follow this light of Christ out into the world, we go. We go knowing that our God is with us. We go with God's own love wrapped around us. We go with our Christ walking before us, with God's own spirit filling us and sustaining us. We go from here to be that living witness that God is present in this world and that there is hope. So as you go from here, go with the full confidence of that in such a way that the world knows that message of hope, of promise. You're sent from here in Christ's name.